because they're the only one speaking out often, they start to doubt themselves and they start to believe that I must be, I must be wrong. I must be the only person who's seeing this, that not all of my clients are easy. Um, (laughs) They are people who don't abide by wrongdoing often. But one of the things that we've been really trying to do to get over this medieval bias that we all have is to talk about whistleblowers in business speak, to recognize what they really are. We have some interesting empirical data that supports it, but there's a social behavioral scientist who does compliance work in the UK named Christian Hunt. And he says we should call whistleblowers what they are. They are forward indicators of risk. But what happens to whistleblowers who expose the government has been on display with the Trump administration in particular, because of his role in trying to silence inspectors general and other oversight individuals. So it the burden has fallen more heavily to whistleblowers to speak out. So there was an unprecedented number of whistleblowers in the Trump administration, not just the Ukraine whistleblower, which we all know about. Who are the enablers of this type mm. of corruption? And I will point my finger as you have appropriately at my profession. Absolutely, lawyers are one of the chief enablers to allowing this to happen. Um, so are the big four accounting firms. Um, yeah. Think about Wirecard, PwC was all over that, right? In Enron, we had our accounting firms there. I mean, that there is a huge system that has to all work in tandem to allow this to happen. I have spent the past 24 years exclusively representing whistleblowers, largely for the first 19 years in the United States, um, in San Francisco, where I specialized in helping whistleblowers access what are now the growing number of whistleblower reward and protection programs in the United States. So I started working under a, a law known as the False Claims Act. Um, which is Lincoln's law. It was, uh, it was adopted in the Civil War, and it actually um, empowers whistleblowers to file a lawsuit in the name of the United States government if they know that federal funds are being misappropriated. It's a cheeky story because we as Americans stole this concept from uh, English common law, and now we're selling it back to you as our <laughs> own idea. Um, But I would like to give you uh, the proper uh, citation and appropriation. So I started in that area, um, which was very rewarding, a lot of Medicare fraud, which is like our NHS program, um, and also defense contractor fraud, obviously areas where the United States government spends lots of money. You want citizen watchdogs to be able to help um, watch that money and make sure that it's not misappropriated. So It started there, very amazing practice. And then um, in the wake of the financial crisis, a bunch of agencies in the United States decided, hey, I want to get in on the act and start representing whistle and start using the valuable information that whistleblowers bring as an incredibly effective enforcement tool. And I also want to welcome them to our programs to help them help us uh, effectuate our mission. So the IRS was our, our tax Authority, our equivalent of HMRC, was the first to roll out. And then the SEC, our securities regulator, our commodities regulator, adopted similar programs in Dodd-Frank after the financial crisis. And now, because of the success of the False Claims Act and these other programs, we now have two more programs. Our Department of Transportation has a program and for um, information about safety defects on cars that make it their way into the U.S. markets. And then finally... Um, as a result of the FinCEN files, the BuzzFeed and ICIJ investigation, we now have one for money laundering as well. So it's a very long-winded way of saying I fell into an amazingly um, exciting and growing field. When I started, I had no idea that it was going to become um, such, a, such a full employment act. Um, and it's been my pleasure to represent the individuals who have the courage to bring this information to speak up to step forward and um, bring this information to help uh, the government and the public. And so um, with a typical case, at what point do you get involved? Is it after they've blown the whistle or when they're thinking about it or or when it's got into, they've run into trouble or at what point do you get involved? Yeah, it really depends. Um, The easiest time for me as as a lawyer guiding whistleblowers is if they've already 
blowing the whistle because then I don't have to spend the amount, it's a fait accompli and I don't have to spend the amount of time that I really normally take when someone is deciding whether to ring the bell to speak out. So um, the easiest ones are ones who've already done it and then I help them deal with the repercussions. Um, but, and, and that's a huge group of my clients. And interestingly, I would say that those clients are often clients who don't even know they're whistleblowers to begin with and only recognize this once they've been treated as one. So for instance, if you're the head of internal audit for a publicly traded company and you start revealing some Enron or uh, patisserie Valerie type problems, um, you may be very unpopular and it may impact the next quarterly earnings report and you may be silenced. And it's those whistleblowers who will come to me and are very much confused, right? They said, I just, I'm just doing my job and all of a sudden I'm radioactive and people don't want to talk to me anymore. And um, I've been basically put in the equivalent of Siberia for my job. So that's one category of whistleblowers. The other ones, which are much more difficult to counsel are whistleblowers who are standing on the fence, mm -hmm. trying to decide whether they jump off the fence and basically undertake what we all know was going to be now, which is a life altering event. You can't unring that bell. Um, so that is another good percentage of my clients. And for that one, I really developed um, a maturity over the, uh, the length of my practice to understand that even though I'm just a lawyer, I'm not trained in psychosocial um, uh, impacts. Um, Along the course of my career, I've recognized that it's very important to sometimes involve and always involve the whistleblowers, immediate family, their spouse, um, and other folks, because it's really a family decision, because we really have to explain to them the parade of horribles that can ensue if they take this act. Um, and that's one of the things that the U.S. whistleblower programs seek to do is not only provide protection against retaliation, against that one employer who um, you spoke up about, but also to provide a financial reward that serves as a basically a financial safety net to deal with the career blacklisting, blackballing that inevitably ensues. So that's a very long-winded answer, but a way of saying that they come to me in various forms of the speak up continuum. And then, and then just understanding a little bit more about that, um, how, the, the financial reward is a, obviously an important factor. What, what kind of thing are we talking about? How, how is that calculated? Yeah, so um, what is significant here is it's a mandatory award. So in the, in the United Kingdom, for instance, HMRC has a reward program, but it's entirely at the discretion of HMRC. They basically say, if you bring us information, we use it, we may or may not give you an award of an undetermined mm -hmm. size. In the United States, um, so let's take the SEC program as an example. All of the agency programs are 10 to 30 percent um, reward that you receive as a percentage of any fine imposed. So if the government imposes, if SEC imposes a billion dollar fine, the whistleblower is entitled to 10 to 30 percent of that. There is no cap on the amount of the award. In Canada, it's very interesting. The Ontario Securities Commission has adopted a parallel program to that of the SEC, but they have decided to put a cap on the amount the whistleblower can receive. So it's 10 to 30 percent, but up to five million dollars. So um, there's just very different um, views about how and how appropriate and whether it needs to be a ceiling. But what motivates those whistleblowers sitting on the fence to make that decision? is the safety of knowing that if their information is helpful and it helps the government to impose a fine or take an enforcement action, they are guaranteed to receive something within that range. What kind of proportion of the people within that group you're representing, Mary, proceed? Do people walk away and say, I just can't do this, you know, I'm going to go back to work, I'm, I'm just going to forget I ever thought about doing this? Uh, do that's a really interesting question. And I actually have never had one walk away. <laughs> really? So wow. it, it's really, it's, um, I've had some, it's very, very, very early stages decide that. But for the most part, as we start analyzing the legal 
um, particularities of a person's case, um, we they inevitably decide to go forward. Of course, in that category where they've already rung, rung the bell and spoken out, 100% of those go forward because they've already- Yeah, um, they're in it. Yeah. They're in it, yeah. But um, I think there's just, what I found with my clients, which I think is really interesting, whether they're, and we can get into this in a minute, whether they're in the United States or in the United Kingdom, because people across the pond can- um, also bring information to the U.S. government. They all don't do it for the money. It's it's something that sticks with them. It's their moral conscience um, has made it such that they feel compelled, like they can't sleep. Um, and it's really often just in a way beyond them that they, they have to speak out. Um, and so that's why we haven't dissuaded many with our parade of horribles, but we certainly at least have helped manage their expectations and that of their families about what might come along after they've spoken up. And, and could you give an example, Mary, of the kind of repercussions that they're facing? You know, kind of the, some of the kind of more ordinary things, but, you know, have you had something really dreadful happen to individual people as a result of this? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm really pleased to answer that question now, and I would answer it very differently now than I think I would when I started in my career, which is that um, I now see the patterns, and as a society, we're now becoming much more adept and at knowing that we have a medieval reaction to whistleblowers, um, and it hasn't changed. We shoot the messenger. If you put your head above the parapet, there is this um, almost in our DNA as humans, uh, a reflexive desire to blame the messenger as a way of burying the message. Um, and I've seen that one of my favorite examples of that is Jess Staley, the CEO of Barclays Bank in the UK, um, was told that he needed, like all um, financial institutions after the financial crisis, that he needed through something called the senior managers regime legislation from the FCA, to adopt an anonymous internal hot re hotline reporting mechanism. And he's obviously sitting at the top of this organization. organization. They hired gold-plated um, experts to come in and institute it. And the first, one of the first shots across the bow comes in the form of a letter from the United States um, through the post that is, is accusing Jess of cronyism in some of his hires. Um, and the first thing he does is immediately try and figure out who the whistleblower is, even though we know that that is actually what's forbidden. You're, the, the person was trying to be anonymous. When he was advised of this fact, he ignored it and doubled down. He, in fact, um, they, in fact, started an investigation that used the American Postal Service, the Postal Inspectors, to try, gave them some pretext for why they needed to see the, the mail and, and basically go deeper in figuring out who it was, just because it was that primal. So right. I think even, I think there's just something, so, so there's something in us that we need to know, um, and that we need to punish the person who's spoken out. So what that means for my clients is inevitably they become radioactive, um, so remember, uh, a company is often doing this, not just to the whistleblower, but to send a message to future whistleblowers. So, um, and the other employees that used to be your colleagues take that message loud and clear. It's like, it's contagious and they don't, so they will, you'll all of a sudden lose that entire safety net that you had of your colleagues. You will, if you're either terminated or if you're not terminated, you're relegated to some job that's basically in the mail room. Um, and so you are stripped of all of what, you know, you train for and your, you know, a lot of what deals with your, obviously your self-worth. In fact, a lot of my clients feel gaslighted and we now know that word. Um, and, and I now can play, uh, can apply that word to describe what I then knew about my clients' feelings, which is that they often, because they're the only one speaking out often, they start to doubt themselves and they start to believe that, I must be, I must be wrong. I must be the only person who's seeing this because everyone else drank the Kool-Aid or I don't even know if it's Kool-Aid. And so I am often the first person who will validate their feelings, which is a really powerful place to be. So we're doing a lot of work right now. In fact, I'm speaking at a conference in a few weeks to the whistleblower bar, lawyers like myself who do this work to try and inform them of sort of that the whistleblower is very much in a traumatic 
sort of post trauma experience when you or or ongoing trauma as you're speaking to them. And so we're, we've gotten much more enlightened about knowing what to look for and what resources to send them and to understand that when you're making the decision whether or not to blow the whistle when you're in the middle of such chaos, maybe it's not the best decision making time for you. And maybe we need to get the clients to sort of stop and take a breather. And often that's why we bring in, if they're amenable, we bring in um, people like their spouses or significants. Except, except your record is that they carry on anyway. Yeah. They seem to be <laughs> however much you try and protect them. Determined, determined. And, and I mean, is there anything that you as a lawyer can do if people are being sidelined or if they're, you know, the, the employer's looking for some excuse to make their life difficult at work? Because sometimes, it, I mean, everybody's got something which you can, you know, even if it's just taking paper clips from the, from the office, you know, there's usually something that people can pin on you, a quarrel with your secretary or, you know, some, something which is true and which could be built up into a real penalty. Is there anything you yeah. can do to protect people from that? There, there, fortunately there are, but I just want to comment on your observation, which is so true that what inevitably happens to our whistleblower clients is that they typically are people who've had um, very successful performance reviews over the course of their career. In fact, there's one whistleblower in the United K Kingdom. He was not my client, but his name is John Banerjee, and he used to work. At, he actually won in the Employment Tribunal, and he used to work at the Royal Bank of Canada. And he was chronically late throughout his career. That was just who he was. And then, of course, when he blows the whistle, that's the time where that chronic late lateness could just no longer be tolerated, and was the pretext for terminating him. So that's very much a common phenomenon. Like you said, they'll dig through your expense reports or find anything they can that's protectual to say they need to terminate you. But in terms of protections, although I'm not an employment lawyer, um, I'm pleased to say that the United Kingdom actually has something called the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which was 20 years to 21 years ago, one of the strongest omnibus type um, pieces of legislation that provided protections um, against retaliation, that a whistleblower had uh, a claim that they could bring in court to say, against their current employer to um, say, um, I want my lost wages back and other things because you took this action against me because I spoke up. What's interesting is that the UK has been outstripped by and outpaced by the European Union, which has now a new um, EU whistleblowing directive. It's supposed to be transposed into national law by the end of this year. And it does something that the US laws, the UK laws have not gone this far. And it's really sort of a leading example is they've actually flipped the burden of proof um, so that it used to be the whistleblower had the burden to bring forward that I was fired because I spoke up. Um, and now it has been switched to the employer that the onus is now on the employer to prove that they fired them for this other reason, which is really significant in a legal basis. And I think the fact that we're starting to see laws that recognize that, I think are going to go a lot longer and further towards protecting whistleblowers. The definition of who can be a whistleblower has also expanded, right? Because it's not always just... Um, an employee, but it can be a gig worker, an independent contractor, it can be all these different things. So the EU directive has expanded that. But the biggest vulnerability, at least in one of our US laws, we finally expanded the protection is, okay, you get those retaliation protections against that one employer, but what about all the future employers yeah. that are going to call and find out if you're now in the paper as a rabble rouser, as a, as a disgruntled employee? Um, we haven't seen those protections except in one um, piece of legislation in the U.S. has recognized that future employers are also liable if they blacklist or blackball because of that. Goodness, that's really because because whistleblowers are very often misfits. I mean, I, I'm in, my prejudice is coming out here. And if you've got a business full of people who know what's going on but they're not saying anything, and then somebody says something, that makes them unusual. Um, not necessarily a misfit, of course, but unusual because they're willing to go against the grain and not with the herd. And so they could be people who are quite difficult employees because yes. they're the ones who don't fit in. They don't yes. get along with the crowd. I love that you you brought us to this point and, and recognize that not all of 
my clients are easy. Um, <laughs> they are people who don't abide by wrongdoing often. But one of the things that we've been really trying to do to get over this medieval bias that we all have is to talk about whistleblowers in business speak, to recognize what they really are. And we have some interesting empirical data that supports it, but there's a social behavioral scientist who does compliance work in the UK named Christian Holt. And he says we should call whistleblowers what they are. They are forward indicators of risk. Instead of being disloyal employees, in fact, they're your most loyal employees. Who else has the temerity to speak up and tell you the hard truths? So I often say they're your number one risk management tool. And there's been an interesting study done um, by two graduate business school professors in the U.S., where they were given access to Navex Global's hotline data anonymized, which is they're the, hot, the largest um, supplier of hotlines to corporations, they anonymized that looked at the data and they found that companies who have hotlines that are ringing off the hook are more profitable than those that have silent hotlines. Seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Mm. Why the who have more quote unquote problems, um, why are they more successful? And it's very much this risk management canary in the coal mine role is that they have fewer federal investigations against them. They have fewer lawsuits, the lawsuits that do come settle for far less. So the idea is that according to Professor Welch, who has like six children, he equates it to being the parent of a teenager. If your teenagers are speaking to you, you can nip something in the bud before it metastasizes into something else. So it very much underlines um, and underscores something I've known intuitively throughout my career is that whistleblowers um, have a positive effect on the company and the company's bottom line. But ironically, because of all the stereotypes and medieval biases we hold, um, we don't treat them as such. Do you, do you think members of boards are coming round to accepting those kind of things now more Mary you know they are willing to accept that maybe it's a good thing or do you think I'm thinking about the UK and, and I'm thinking of the post office scandal which I know you work in London um, I know you're aware of the post office scandal you know I with the impression we have we don't know but the impression we have is the board wasn't a, a board that was accessible to whistleblowers particularly and perhaps didn't want to hear certain things. And that was known throughout the whole, you know, layers of, of management. But do you, do you think things are changing and, and they've, they're, they're being, you know, more enlightened in the way they approach things now? I do. And it's a really positive trend. And one of the things I'm observing is that really the fate of whistleblowers is often tied to the fate of compliance officers. And so we've done, because that's often the first person in an organization that has to deal, they, they may not be the person to whom the report was made, but it's the person who is obviously dealing with and advising the company on how to move forward. And we've done a lot of work on helping compliance officers see in themselves that they, in, in a way, themselves are whistleblowers, right? They are cost centers. They are often the people who are giving the advice that no one wants to take. Um, and sort of as a way to sort of, and see how they've felt when they've been in those situations. And I think that's made them much more sympathetic and receptive to whistleblowers, which I think is really important so that they can be a champion. But most importantly, because of all the scandals that we've seen around the globe um, and the fact that there were compliance officers in all of those situations who were likely silenced, um, there's now a move to make sure to rise and, and rise the position of compliance officers to put, make it a board level position to make it a place where they're not so easily overruled. So I, that's a great development. And I think the fate of whistleblowers is very much tied to that. So if the boats rise for compliance officers, then so do the boats for whistleblowers. And then what happens if you're blowing the whistle against the government? Because I'm one of the formative books I remember reading as a teenager was a bright shining lie about the Vietnam War and how President Johnson didn't want to hear what was happening in reality. So he was fed untrue statistics or meaningless statistics about progress of the war. And nobody dared speak out. The lie was perpetuated until the defeat occurred. And, and there are obviously some gross examples of governments behaving 
in a mistaken way or maybe a corrupt way and people wanting to speak out about it, what happens to them? Uh, and that's a fantastic book, by the way. I remember reading that in college. Wow. Um, the, the hypocrisy of the United States government in particular, which is so embracing of whistleblowers when they are serving as a confidential informant to help them, um, is really stark when the whistleblowers are actually exposing wrongdoing by the government. So we have a very unequal system. We have pushed very, we've been very vocal in saying reward should not be limited to those whistleblowers, but very much also to the whistleblowers who expose government fraud. Of course, the government has not been very receptive to that argument. But what happens to whistleblowers who expose the government has been on display with the Trump administration in particular, because of his role in trying to silence inspectors general and other oversight individuals. So it the burden has fallen more heavily to whistleblowers to speak out. So there was an unprecedented number of whistleblowers in the Trump administration, not just the Ukraine whistleblower, which we all know about, um, but just many more. And for instance, one of my favorite was a whistleblower by the name of Trisha Newbold. Trisha Newbold is a woman of diminutive status that becomes um, important to the story. Um, and she worked in the White House and for years in the security clearance department that was dealing with clearances on who can be in the White House. Um, and folks like Jordan Kushner and other folks were actually all the warnings went up and because of their dealings with oligarchs and other things, she the rules would say that they should be denied the clearance. And she was pressured into changing um, her viewpoint. And in terms of retaliation, um, getting back to that um, issue, because she's a very small woman, um, her colleagues to retaliate started putting her files um, out of reach on file cabinet way above where she could get to. So that just sort of shows to you, like in a very small scale, um, the role that whistleblowers continue to play um, as a check against government overreach. And then we have a whole separate story on when you get into national security whistleblowers. Uh, of course, my favorite is Catherine Gunn, who is featured in the Official Secrets. Um, and I think that's a really interesting because she was a GCHQ and exposed the fact that in trans she was a translator and saw that the American government was asking the Brits to go along with bugging offices um, in the UN member states for the swing votes in the lead up to the Iraq vote on the Iraq war. Um, and what's interesting to me about her is very much the, the journalist who, by the name of Martin Bright from The Observer, who actually reported her information, suffered many of the same um, consequences. It's sort of a ripple effect on not just um, the whistleblowers themselves, but also on the journalists who dare to report it. And then and then I, I'll just ask you about what's happening in the UK, because you, you practice over here as well as in the States, but the rules are different, um, or at least the safeguards are different or the rewards are different. But what are you seeing here? Is it, is, is it moving in the direction of recognizing the benefit of whistleblowers or is it, uh, is it a different situation here uh, compared to the States? Yeah, this has been uh, a subject of fascination for me during my four years in, in working and in, in living in the UK. Um, I have to be really clear, I am not a UK qualified um, solicitor. I exclusively help British citizens, British people bring information to the US government. So that's my narrow remit, although I work closely with UK qualified employment lawyers, criminal lawyers who often have to give advice to my clients. But in terms of the environment, what I found to be fascinating is that um, the United Kingdom is very culturally um, averse to the notion of paying rewards to whistleblowers. Um, and what I have often pushed back on, um, and I have many reasons for why uh, I think that is, um, and I think a lot of the reasons of the bias against rewards is because of the messenger that um, Americans are very much viewed by Brits as rightly or wrongly, overly mercenary or capitalism unchecked. It's seen very much as um, you Americans, you have to pay people to the, do the right thing. We're British. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Like you, you, oh. uh, 
you transactionalize everything, you crazy Americans. Um, and so that was a bias I didn't expect. So that in every cocktail conversation, when I when I introduce myself and what I do, people would literally step back. Um, and I'm pleased to say that um, when you reframe what rewards seek to do, British, the at least certainly the parliamentarians we've been working with, with the all-party parliamentary group for whistleblowing, step back and put it in their own terms and basically see it as um, basically unemployment insurance. We treat someone who lost their um, arm on a production line in a similar way, we should be thinking of whistleblowers that way, that they basically destroyed their careers. So when you think about that as a safety net, it's gotten more traction. Um, but anyway, in terms of um, how whistleblowers are doing in the UK, one of the best things, and I think one of the most vital things that we've observed is that whistleblowers who come to us have already tried to speak to the Financial Conduct Authority and basically have been ignored. Um, so you will see lots of whistleblowers come to us because they feel like the United States government takes whistleblowers more seriously, but more importantly, actually does something with the message and takes enforcement action. So there's, we've seen in lots of um, scandals, you think about the um, big scandal involving Danske Bank, there was a UK citizen by the name, whistleblower by the name of Howard Wilkinson, and he was working in the Ukrainian branch. Um, and he saw amazing amounts of money laundering going on. And the, he brought it to the Ukrainian regulators. He brought it to the Dutch regulators, the Danska regulator, the regulators there. And the, but he filed a tip with the SEC and that's where he got traction. So you look at like the FX manipulation, the LIBOR manipulation. These are all scandals that happened in European banks and American banks, but it's really the U.S. regulator who let it out in imposing the fines. And I think that is what buoys whistleblowers in the U.K. to if they really want not just to have retaliation protections, but their message to be heard and dealt with. And I think they have more faith in the U.S. Um, programs than they do in their own government. And we've actually these SEC tracks the number of whistleblowers who come. They do an annual report to Congress. And we've tracked the data 10 years running and year over year, the United Kingdom is the number one country outside the US that supplies tips to the American government. The people we've spoken to who've been involved in whistleblowing, I think in the UK have, have all really concluded that the best thing to do is to keep your head down and resign and find another job um, rather than start making waves within the organization because it's not tolerated and there's no protection for people and where does that leave us I, I i agree that that's the sentiment where does and how much poorer are we as a society that mm. these people yeah. aren't who serve their canary in the coal mine function for us mm. well it depends <laughs> what what you mean by poor as a society I mean, and the other whistleblowers that we've spoken to were the politicians on the island of Jersey who tried to expose the child abuse scandal and they were driven off the island by various means of financial punishment of one sort or another. But of course, Jersey's protecting its financial circumstances and the way their culture works. So these people clearly didn't fit in and, and had to leave. And so yes. it depends what you believe should be the right culture, I suppose. That's very true. Although uh, Jersey, the Isle of Man are uh, in full display in the new Pandora Papers, Panama Papers. Um, so hopefully we're shining through the important work of investigative journalists shining a light and the important work of leakers, people who are leaking that information to them. Um, so again, leaker, you know, our whistleblowers, our leakers, whistleblowers. Um, I just think as the imbalance continues where wealth is concentrated in the hands of fewer and few. One of the one ways we can fight back is the, the, the individual, um, the small person can bring that information, that data forward. So I haven't had a chance since Pandora just was announced. I haven't had a chance to look, but with Panama Papers, we know some it had to have been someone within Monsec Fonseca, the, the law firm that was helping set up all these trusts. So I, I take comfort every morning when I get up to do this work, that it's these people are there 
um, who um, undertake enormous risks to make sure that they expose corruption. And one of the things that we're increasingly struck by as we do interviews with people who've been in unjust circumstances is the is the role that lawyers have been taking inside corporations and those that advise corporations, whose job very often seems to be to cover up um, whatever it is that the corporation is trying to hide uh, and, to, and by devious means um, drive out uh, the, the opposition or anybody who's, who's uh, you know, undermining what the corporation sees as in, its interests, but using methods which are not entirely honest. You know, they, they sail as close to the, the illegal wind as they can. And that seems to be the hallmark of the best paid legal firms. <laughs> that is, you're paying for that ability to sail as close to the wind as is possible. And, and so it's deeply entrenched in culture, this one of cover up and, um, uh, and, and corporations organizing themselves around covering up at great expense, usually. You put your finger on uh, absolutely the role of what we call the enablers. Who are the enablers of this type mm. of corruption? And I will point my finger, as you have appropriately, at my profession. Absolutely, lawyers are one of the chief enablers to allowing this to happen. Um, so are the big four accounting firms. Um, yeah. Think about Wirecard. PwC was all over that, right? In Enron, we had our accounting firms there. I mean, that there is a huge system that has to all work in tandem to allow this to happen. And so some of the best things we've seen, of course, is some amazing uh, big four whistleblowers um, who've exposed the Wirecard scandal. Um, there's a marvelous gentleman in the UK by the name of Amjad Rahan, who exposed Exposed ENY basically money laundering and helping Kaladi Gold um, launder their money. Um, so they, we need more whistleblowers coming out of the big four. We need whistleblowers coming out of law firms. We haven't seen it. There was one gentleman I know who actually did um, blow the whistle on his law firm, a UK gentleman. I'm forgetting his name, but it's very rare. Mm. And part of that is that they can cloak themselves in saying, I can't divulge my attorney client privilege, but of course in the United States, I don't know the UK equivalent, but in the US you cannot, you can pierce the attorney client privilege if you're helping them commit a crime. If they're helping them perpetrate a crime, you can no longer avail yourself of the attorney client privilege. All right, I'm not sure if that applies here. I don't know. I don't, no, well, I don't it know. would be interesting for us to find out. I mean, we, we've been hearing with the post office scandal as well. They, they've adopted a phrase um, that's called the scorched earth policy of, of litigation. <laughs> You've probably heard of it, Mary, but, you know, where they will outspend anybody just to protect themselves. And so people who don't have money find it impossible to um, survive financially if they... Um, come up against a, a big organization that it does that happen a lot in in the u.s as well the same kind of ways of embarking on litigation absolutely it's the inequality of arms right that's why a whistleblower story is always a david versus goliath story because you're going up against the most well-resourced um organizations and you're you have your you know salary and means to try and go against them it's interesting one of the things i've observed is that in the US, the whistleblower lawyers who do this kind of work like myself, we represent our clients on a success fee or contingency fee basis, which allows whistleblowers, I mean, frankly, I couldn't afford my hourly rate. So it allows whistleblowers to have lawyers and not just lawyers, but lawyers who are aligned with your interests. Because if we're representing you on a success fee basis, we're only going to invest in cases that we think are going to win or we don't um, get paid and we have to keep the lights on. So we have not seen, I have not seen that level of comfort with success fees in the UK. So I think yeah. one of the things I've observed is the clients in working with a lot of really terrific claimant side um, UK employment firms here is that it's just people who's in short home insurance can cover up to a certain amount of uh, amount or they represent people in the executive suite who can afford the services. So I think we're being disturbed by, uh, that's just something else that adds to the inequality of arms. So if you want to be a whistleblower, what, how do you set about it? What, what do you need? What's your, what's your toolkit 
to be a successful whistleblower? Wow, that's a great question. And um, we've done some thinking there. Um, there's something in the United States that we call the Mayo Clinic model, which has sort of revolutionized healthcare, but only the Mayo Clinic, as far as I know, follows this approach. And it's it relates to your question, which is that when someone is sick, they can spend an enormous amount of time jumping from expert to specialist, to specialist, to specialist, back to their GP and all of their tests are, you know, there's all this room for error. And what the Mayo Clinic saw is that let's put the patient in the room with everyone who's going to make these decisions and get you the decision once and that let them interact in real time. And I've often thought, and we put together um, for the FT, the Financial Times Global Legal Hackathon for COVID, a bunch of us put together um, a proposal that basically was equating for a, a Mayo like Mayo clinic like model for whistleblowers, because what they need to answer your question is not just lawyers, they need psychosocial support, they need um, journalists, um, there's a whole host of people who could be in the room to help them. Um, and so one of the most difficult parts for whistleblowers is they'll go to the wrong person. Um, and so we very much wanted to create that environment. Um, it's obviously a big blue sky thinking that we're doing, but um, I think that's part of the problems we've seen is you can go to the wrong journalist, right? So if you're a whistleblower and you don't know that you have these legal options or you don't have the money to pay a lawyer to deal with your retaliation claims, you will often, often go to, to the media. And I'm pleased to say that there's now a bunch of organizations, including Blueprint for Free Press, which has put out something called the Perugia Principles on teaching journalists how to deal ethically with whistleblowers because... The answer is sometimes they they should not be your source or you really need to think about how to protect them. There's another group called the Signals Network that does something similar. So we would love to see whistleblowers put together with the appropriate lawyers and the who have the appropriate expertise, but also the appropriate journalists who know how to deal responsibly with them. And also to have what we're now starting to see is the incredible amount of resources that whistleblowers need much like PTSD survivors, that they also need um, therapy and resources to deal with the trauma that is being gaslit. So who am I going to phone? I mean, is it... <laughs> you, can phone, you can phone me and I'll get you in touch with all of those great journalists. Um, yeah. The problem is we've often seen uh, our clients come to us too late where they've gone to a law firm or a journalist who has not had the sophistication to see what their options are. How many lawyers in the UK do you think are able to deal with these kinds of cases, Mary? Are, are there a lot? I somehow doubt it. There are. It's interesting. When I left the US to come to the UK, I had all my US notions in my head. And in the US, for better or worse, our employment lawyers bar is very much plaintiffs or defendants based. So you come in and you say, I'm a plaintiff's lawyer. And so I absolutely thought when I would come to the UK that I would go find all of these claimant side employment firms and they would be a natural ally for my clients. There aren't that many. Um, it's sort of much more nuanced. People will often re represent both sides, but increasingly there are more and increasingly there, there are more who have whistleblower specialties. So um, the resources are there. Um, but again, what I've observed is that they will sometimes take on a pro bono basis um, some of the whistleblowers who can't afford their fees, but for the most part, it's the executives who can. So I've sort of been disheartened by that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some great lawyers out there. And the other thing, we've done a lot of work. Um, we spent a lot of time doing educational programming for um, UK employment firms to explain to them the US systems um, so that they are aware that their clients might have this additional resource to them that could actually pay them money. So um, one of the things I remember is Michael Woodford who was the, the whistleblower, he was really well represented. He was, but he was the CEO of this, Jap the first non-Japanese CEO of this company. And he observed um, the fact that there was actually what seemed to be mafia money and other money laundering going on. 
Um, and so he reveals it and is fired. He hires a fantastic law firm in the UK who helps him with his employment claim, but he's never aware of the fact that he actually would have had a really strong claim in the United States. And in fact, someone else brought that claim um, and received a lot of money. Um, so I always use that sort of as the example of, I really would love to see um, more, more employment lawyers who are usually the first port of call for whistleblowers to be aware of these other opportunities that whistleblowers have. Are we getting, are we getting some help from Parliament? It sounds as though Parliament's looking at whistleblowing, Mary. What, how far have we got with any of that here? Yeah, I think with the help of Baroness Kramer, um, about four years ago now, there was the founding of an all-party parliamentary group for whistleblowing to deal with these very issues. In fact, she um, now co-chairs it with M Mary Robinson, and it's very cross-bench, the parliamentarians who support. Annalisa Dodds is there for labor. There's a huge group. Um, and so they've been successful and I've worked closely with them, just more giving advice and, and talking more, introducing them to members of the CFTC, the SEC, who've come over to speak to them about their programs and the role whistleblowers play. Um, much more um, of a broader notion of what supports whistleblower needs beyond um, just retaliation protections, but they very much want to overhaul PETA, the Public Interest Disclosure Act, and realize it's it's long overdue. Um, and they actually have bills circulating in, there was one that has just gone past, but there's another one that's active from Baroness Kramer that's trying to create an office of the whistleblower within government in the UK to handle, you know, both public, private whistleblowers in the public and private context. So, um, that's really exciting. So there's real traction. That's good. Um, so we'll, we'll see um, where it gets, but we're seeing an increasing number of um, parliamentarians getting behind the idea that whistleblowers can help deal with the Carillion crisis and many other crises that if we'd known sooner, uh, we mm. would have done a lot better in protecting. And I suppose life. social media must be making a difference. That is, people can... Um, communicate through social media and remain pretty anonymous. In fact, if you if you try hard, you can be quite anonymous still and, and share information yeah. with other people. You so know. that that may help mm -hmm. people to um, at least identify other people who share their concerns and um, they're not yeah. alone. That's hard. And we've started to see tech. I mean, whistleblowers are frequently siloed, right? You look at the number of scandal, scandals, the emissions cheating scandals mm -hmm. at Volkswagen. There were so many different whistleblowers, but they didn't seem to ever be put together. Um, similarly, with at Boeing with the 737 MAX um, failures, we've seen th similar things. So there's an interesting phenomenon going on right now. And I often am amazed to see the tech advancements. So um, now, if you want to bring information to the Financial Times or any newspaper, they have very sophisticated um, methods for you to anonymously give your information. You used to just dump an envelope at their desk and walk away on their doorstep and walk away. Now you can have two way anonymous, uh, one way anonymous conversations with them and that it helps sort of engender their trust so that you can actually have a conversation. Maybe they will feel compelled to speak to you. But what's been interesting is the tech we've seen coming out of the Me Too movement, there's a UK company called Vault that is now also a provider of internal reporting hotlines, but they have a new feature called Go Together that gets at this, um, very much this need that we need for whistleblowers is to put them together. So their feature's called Go Together and you don't have to file, your disclosure is held in the system until someone else lines up beside you and identifies the same perpetrator. So it, obviously in sexual harassment cases, you would be alone and pending until someone else came with you, which obviously provides safety and numbers and another, a lot of other protections, but it's a way of linking those whistleblowers together. Um, so I think the tech can help very much. And I would love to see whistleblowers united in that way. Interesting, Vault just got some funding to um, expand their go together algorithm to go beyond just perpetrators, but to actually link people who are identifying the same frauds 
Um, so I think it will continue. I think we'll start seeing our groups like my mine or Whistleblowers UK or other things trying to use this technology ourselves, not just on the company side, but um, on the whistleblower advocate side to bring whistleblowers together to get over that hurdle of going it alone. In the wake of the Me Too movement with a number of the Weinstein whistleblowers in particular, but also Zelda Perkins being one of the UK yeah. whistleblowers, um, we saw that a lot of them were silenced um, because, or effectively gagged because they were too worried about the impact of violating a non-disclosure agreement and then being fined or penalized for that. Um, so a lot of states in the United States, um, some of the more progressive states that lead in this sort of area, like California created laws in California, we came up with a law called the Stand Act that made unenforceable um, provisions in employment agreements, separation agreements, um, confidentiality agreements that employers make you sign that in effect um, preclude you from speaking out about wrongdoing. So it was narrowly limited to sex discrimination, sexual harassment, sexual assault. And just this year, a Pinterest whistleblower by the name of Ifoma Azoma has gotten through, helped spearhead an effort to get a new law called Silence No More, um, which expands the protections not to just sex discrimination, but also adds it to race discrimination, age discrimination, disability, and most importantly for me in my practice, people who are speaking up against fraud. So um, those pieces of um, uh, in agreements that had silence will no longer be enforceable. This is particularly compelling for me, particularly I represent a client by the name of Tyler Schultz, who is one of the Theranos whistleblowers. And I feel like his situation, so Theranos was a blood testing company in Silicon Valley run by a CEO named a Wunderkind called Elizabeth Holmes. Um, and it turned out that she was saying that you could test um, all of these assays of blood with just a finger prick where we used to have to do all of the vials. And it turns out that um, while it was a fantastic idea, she never was able to put it into practice and in fact started um, sending erroneous test results and other things to patients. So what I thought was so fascinating about the story is Tyler Schultz spoke up, spoke to the, to the Wall Street Journal, and the company sued him for violating his confidentiality agreement, basically saying that he had revealed trade secrets. Um, and he very much famously said, fraud is not a trade secret. We can't, um, you know, we can't stop people from talking about a massive fraud on investors um, under the shroud of this. So he ended up incurring $400,000 in attorney's fees. His parents had to mortgage his home. And so, uh, this silence, no more act, which is sitting on the governor's desk about to be signed, um, would have protected and found unenforceable and not allowed that kind of, um, very bullying, um, harassing lawsuits to be filed against whistleblowers because that's just the other and the inequality of arms we were talking about that's just one more way um yeah. that they can shoot the messenger is sue the messenger and bury you in legal costs so i think we're making a lot i know we're making a lot of strides in that area and interestingly in the uk um we now have through zelda perkins good offices um an effort in parliament to create a comparable law and their movement is called can't buy my silence um and i think, believe maria miller and other um, parliamentarians are fully on board so i would love to see that get traction 